So game theory is very important in economics, and it's interesting to ask how games change when they're played using quantum logic instead of classical logic. So quantum game theory seems to uh, have started back in 1999 when quantum computing was still in its infancy. And um, there were uh, two games uh, that we're going to talk about. Uh, one is the Prisoner's Dilemma, which will be the subject of the next segment. And uh, the first one is the Penny Flip game. So this is sort of extremely simple game using a quantum device where we have two players, A and B. Player A starts by positioning uh, a coin in the up state. And player B can choose to flip the coin or not without A seeing. Then player A can choose to flip the coin or not without B seeing. Uh, player B can choose to flip the coin or not without A seeing again. And if the coin ends heads up, then B wins, otherwise A wins. So uh, we'll denote the up-down states of the coin as usual, as uh, up will be 1, 0, down will be 0, 1. And uh, the choices to flip or not flip a coin can then be represented by the, um, this is the, uh, the not gate, basically, which just flips, and the identity, which keeps it the same. So a quantum circuit for this game would, would look like this, where we've got uh, three different moves. So uh, player A positions the, the coin in uh, the heads-up state, and then uh, player B gets to make a move, then player A gets to make a move, and player B finally gets to make a move, and then we measure the outcome here and uh, uh, and see uh, whether it's heads up or tails up. And the, the different outcomes, we can just do a sort of a, a table for all the different possibilities. So we always, we always start in the uh, up position, and then we've got um, the different moves can be so if uh, player B does the identity or if they flip, and, and so on and so forth. And, and what you find is that, you know, half the time it's going to be up and half the time it's going to be down. So each player should win 50% of the time. So as an example, let's say that, um, so player A, their first move, as always, is to is, uh, put the coin in the up position. So player B then gets the choice. So let's say that they um, uh, make a decision to, to flip the coin. And then Player A decides to uh, stay, so just plays the identity, so nothing changes. And then player B, so player B, they basically have to guess. They, they knew what the state was at, at this point here. And the next move, they don't know what's happened, so they have to guess what happened. So let's say that they, they guess and they decide to flip, and it ends heads up. So the coin ends up, and player B wins. So that's fine. But... Um, suppose now that player A employs a mixed strategy of randomly selecting to flip or not flip each time. So they play the identity with probability of half, and they flip with probability of one half, and then the expected payoff for either player is going to be zero, because it's a uh, um, you know, zero-sum game. But after playing several times, player B wins every time. So this makes no sense. What is going on? Um, so it's a bit like this... Uh, coin trick by Darren Brown, uh, a magician, and uh, he, he he does this thing where he you take somebody from an audience onto the stage and uh, that person holds a, a coin uh, sort of behind their back and then holds both hands out the front and uh, Darren Brown has to guess which uh, hand is holding the coin and uh, does this several times in a row and you know uh, how does he do it so there are all these ideas, you know, neuro-linguistic programming or whatever, uh, of course the real answer is that it's it's magic um, in his case. But for our case, it's, it's simpler. It's that uh, player B is cheating by applying the Hadamard transformation, uh, which again is this matrix, in move one to the initial coin, thus putting the coin into this mixed state, into the superposed state, sorry. Um, so what happens is that, remember, the player A is using a, a mixed strategy, so they're, they're going to apply either, um, they're either going to flip or they're not going to flip. But either flipping or not flipping has no effect on the superposed state. Um, so neither has, uh, you know, neither does anything. And then 
player B gets to apply the Hadamard transformation again at the end because they get the last move and so that has the effect of always putting the coin back in the up state so the answer is always up and B wins. So it's uh, a classical analogy of this would be that player B turns a normal coin by 90 degrees so it's on its edge. Um, if uh, player A flips the coin or not it's still going to remain on its edge and then uh, player B turn, turns it by 90 degrees again so it is face up and, and wins the game. So of course you know, in the classical version a coin on its edge has a it can't. It's not allowed to be on the edge. It's going to have a 50-50 chance of falling either way. But the thing is, a quantum coin, you can, you can do this. This is really um, the great thing about uh, quantum probability is that you can keep a superposition of two states. Um, and this was uh, pointed out by David Mayer, who invented this game back in 1999. And he pointed out that quantum strategies can be more successful than classical ones. And that's uh, proven to be very true some 20 years ago, for example. IBM in a report they're pointing out that the data modeling capabilities of quantum computers are expected to prove superior in finding patterns, performing classifications, and making predictions that are not possible today because of the challenges of complex data structures. And the reason uh, for this is that you know quantum computers get extra, you know, vastly stronger computational power because they can they can play these sort of quantum tricks. Um, so a typical kind of a quantum algorithm um, for something like um, this is the Grover search algorithm. What it does is it uh, takes uh, some initial qubits and it superposes them, puts them into a superposed state using versions of the, the uh, using the Hadamard transformation on each qubit, and then it will uh, do a particular operator here, which again involves sort of a mix of the Hadamard transformation and other simple transformations, and then you collapse to the end to get the answer. So um, so basically, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try to explain how that algorithm works, but the, the main point is that uh, quantum computers can use, they, they, they get extra, extra space to do uh, moves which are simply not possible using classical computers. And uh, it's exactly these moves that seem to play such a key role in human cognition.